Okay, so then let's restart the class. So we said that there was some issue about the uh, consequential or reasoning using too much. We also saw with business when we had the case of Ford Pinto, where they thought about the profit. Sometimes we can think people use like profit or money as the consequence, right? The most important consequence, like in business. Then with they can forget forget if you forget about the rights, it can cause some damage. So we can think about the consequences, but we should also think about the rights, okay? Like we saw in our ethical dilemma, first we list the stakeholders, then we list their rights and obligations, okay, for the business. So we've had some different philosophers and different kinds of thinking. Uh, first of all, we've got Locke, who was libertari libertarians. What did they think? They thought that this consequentialist reasoning is okay, but there are some certain fundamental rights that are so important that no government can override them. <coughs> Do you understand fundamental? Right, basic. So they said life, liberty, and property. Life, everybody has the right to life, okay? So in their case with the Romans, <coughs> the, we couldn't have killing people by lines for other people's entertainment. Even if the consequence was that those 40,000 people are very happy, so consequently it looks better, right? To kill that person using a line. But he says no, because here they say life is a fundamental right, okay? Then, uh, liberty, so freedom and expression to say things. And property. So <clears throat> this came. Locke was a guy who was living in the U.S. just when the U.S. was starting off. So they were, he was living with the Indians, right, together. So the Indians didn't have any common property, or sorry, didn't have any individual property. For the Indians in America, the Native Americans, everybody owned the land together. So they would hunt together with the buffalo and so on. So we can understand this is one of the reasons that they thought property was important. When the new settlers came to the US, they made a fence and they said, this is my property. Okay? So they were quite concerned about their property right, that they owned this area. <coughs> so. They said that people should not be used merely as a means to the welfare of others because doing so violates the fundamental right of self-ownership. My life, my labor and person belong to me and me alone. They are not at the disposal of society as a whole. So we shouldn't just say use this person so that the others can be better, okay? Because I have my own ownership. I own my life, I own my labor, like we saw, these fundamental rights. So society as a whole, we have democracy. So the government could be run in a democratic system. It means that we have uh, society, the majority of people in society can choose the government and the government can make the law. Okay, so can society, through the government, can they decide to use me for the welfare of others? Okay, one example we could have would be the military conscription. Do you understand conscription? So when the country goes to war, like the US went to war in Vietnam, do you know Elvis Presley? Uh, yes. Elvis Presley was conscripted to join the, the army. It means that he didn't have any choice. He had to join the army. <clears throat> what would happen to him if he didn't join the army? 
go to jail, right? He would have to go to jail if he didn't join the army. That's conscription, okay? So, in this case, they're saying that we shouldn't be used as a means just for the welfare of others, right? My life, labor, and person belong to me. Uh, Kant. Then let's move on to Kant, who has a slightly different view than the libertarian. So Kant is a very widely... We're going to look at Kant and Raoul's, who these days are very widely used philosophical ideas, still used today, right? So, from Aristotle, the point of law is to shape character, to cultivate the virtue, to make possible a good way of life for everybody. So, shaping character, do you understand cultivate? Like growing, people's virtues grow. Aristotle had the vice virtue, okay, excess. So he said we want the virtue, everybody to act in a virtuous way, and the law should help us to shape our character and act in a vir virtuous way, and then everybody can have a happy or good life. Kant had a different idea of the purpose of law. He said it's not to promote virtue, it's to set up a fair framework of rights. You understand framework? within which citizens can be free to pursue their own ideas of the good for themselves. So Aristotle had his idea. So cowardly is a vice. Okay? Courageous is a virtue. Recklessness is an excess. But Kant said people have their own ideas about what is good and what's not good. Okay? So they can, we can make a framework of rights that people should do and shouldn't do, right? People have certain rights. And then after that, you have, can have your own idea about what's good and what's not good. So he was, this was, he was living in the 18th century. So he had another account of duties and rights than the libertarians. So I think we mentioned in the last class, we're looking at a bit more detail now. He says that we are all rational beings worthy of dignity and respect. So basically we're not animals. We are different than animals. Why are we different than animals? According to Kant, it's because we are rational. Okay? So rational means that, we'll talk about his idea of freedom later, but for example, you come, why are you coming to the university? Why do you go to the university? What's the reason? Okay, so make yourself a more logical person, right? Or to gain employment later. So you that you rationally thought that out, right? But the animals can't rationally think things out like that. Okay? So he says we are worthy of dignity and respect. So if we throw somebody to the lions in the Colosseum, is that dignified? Do you understand dignified? It's not dignified, right? They are not being respected, and it's not dignity. So Kant puts his emphasis on human dignity. So this informs the present day notion of human rights. So we have a lot of human rights treaties. We have we talked about torture. We have an international treaty on torture. Okay? Usually the UN is involved in these human rights treaties. The UN has the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is just principle. Okay? So the countries sign up to the principle. Okay, then after that, there is treaty. Treaty is stronger than the principle. Treaty means agreement between you and me. Okay, so countries sign up to treaty. It means that, let's say there is a treaty on torture. It means we all sign that we are, if we do torture, right, then uh, there is going to be some result. Involved in the treaty, it will explain the result. Okay? So there's a treaty on genocide. Do you understand genocide? Yes, yes. So usually they will go to the war crimes. After the war, they do torture or that kind of thing. They will go to some court, which will treat with them about the war crimes or the torture. So many of these things are based on uh, Kant's idea that human beings are worthy of dignity and respect, right? Because we have different religions all over the world. So if we are going to make an international treaty, 
you can't make the treaty just based on one religion. Okay? So they're using uh, Kant's ideas for this kind of treaty. <coughs> so other treaties we have is uh, women's, women's rights, children's rights, that kind of thing. So most countries sign up to these, these tre international treaties on human rights. So, respecting human dignity means treating persons as an end in themselves. So we shouldn't treat people as means, we should treat them as an end. So maybe that you don't really understand, so we're going to explain about means and ends, right? Treating people as a means is using them. Have you heard, ever heard the expression using somebody? Using someone? No? It's not really respecting them, right? How could you use somebody? For example, I, I like your friend, right? Say I'm just 20 years old, I'm one of your friends, and I like your friend, she's a girl. But I don't really like you, right? But I'm just going to use you to make friends with the girl. So I pretend to be very friendly with you, I say let's go out together. Really, I just want to meet the girl, not you. <laughs> then I'm just using you. Do you understand? That's using person as a means. You're just a means. You're a means or a way that I can meet your friend. Okay? So I'm not treating you with respect or with dignity. So Kant says we, sh we should pe treat people as an end in themselves. So for example, lying to your mother out of concern for her feelings would arguably use her as a means to her own contentment rather than respect her as a rational being. So for example, your brother died, right? But you don't want to tell your mother now because it's a bad time. You're worried about her feelings. You think, maybe I can tell her tomorrow or another time. But Kant says that if you lie to her because you're worried about your feelings, her feelings, you're just using her as a way to make her happy, a means, a means means a way. Rather than if you tell her the truth now, you would be respecting her as a human being. So some people would argue with that, right? They would say, this is where it's a little bit different than religion. Religion would say, like kind of treat others as you would like them to treat yourself, right? And that's kind of, we said, that's kind of like a golden rule in almost all religions and a lot of moral philosophies. But Kant is a little bit different than that rule here. Because you would like to be treated, let's say, you think about your mother, if that was me, I wouldn't want somebody to tell me today. I'd wait for them to wait, want them to wait for two days. Okay, so that would be treating your mother like you think you would like to be treated, right? You have some concern for her feeling, so you're not going to tell her now, you're going to lie to her, and then tell her later. But Kant says, no, no, don't do that, just tell her now. Don't worry about her feeling, because that's not respecting her properly. It's just using her... Uh, so it's a, a little bit different. So this can be a little bit complicated idea, right? It's a philosophical idea, so even in your own language it could be difficult to understand that, that kind of idea, right, from philosophy. So we, we see the main point is that respecting human dignity, don't treat people as a means, treat them as an end. Okay? <coughs> so, for example, pushing the heavy man onto the track here uh, to block the trolley uses him as a means and fails to respect him. So this is Kant's idea of rights. Kant says, why don't you push the man onto the track? Kant is going to say, no, don't push the man onto the track. Track, right? Most of you agree with Kant, don't push the man onto the track, right? But Kant says, why? Why don't push him onto the track? Because we are using him as a means, not as an end, right? Like I was just using you as a means, as a way of doing some other consequence. So he says we're just using this man as a means of doing something else, not as an end. So is that treating him with respect and dignity? No, it's very undignified to be pushed off the the uh, pushed off the bridge. So Kant thinks that that's very important, respecting human dignity. So.
So he also has this idea of duty. In Korea, I notice people have a strong idea of duty. I wonder, is it because of Kant or someone else? Other tradition or history? Do you understand duty? Yes. Yes? For example, in Korea you have the military service, it's a little bit like duty, yes. doing your duty for the country. And people in Korea generally think, I need to do something because it's my duty. Even if it's bad for me, I should do it, it's my duty. So Kant has this idea of duty, but do you think that in Korea people have the idea of duty because of Kant or because of someone somewhere else? Kant is a German philosopher. <laughs> Korean law is mainly based on German law. So Kant is known in Korea, but do you think there's some other cultural cultural issue which is at play in Korea? Why people do their duty? I don't know, I'm asking you. You know about Korean history and tradition? Korean civil war yes. changed the people to protect the country. Okay. So the Korean War means that people feel more uh, nationalist, right? Yes. And they feel a duty to their country. Yes. Maybe the financial crisis in 1997. People say that one of the reasons that Korea responded very well to the financial crisis is that people all came together. Like for example, they collected the gold. They gave the gold, right? Yes. My wife's mother gave her a wedding ring, right? That kind of thing. A lot of the people gave their gold to pay for the IMF, right? They had some hardship together, okay? So maybe the Korean people will like Kant's idea about duty. Doing something because it's right, not because it's useful or convenient, such as self-interest. For example, our action lacks moral worth. So for example, a child goes into the grocery store, do you understand the grocery store? Yes. To buy a loaf of bread. So the grocer could overcharge the child, and the child would not know, it's just a child. So the shopkeeper could ask for more money. But the grocer realizes that if others discovered that he took advantage of the child, using, taking advantage of, is a similar one, right? In this way, Word might spread and hurt his business. So for this reason, he decides not to overcharge the child. So the shopkeeper acts honestly only out of self-interest. So Kant doesn't like this, right? Because this shopkeeper did the right thing. He didn't overcharge the child, right? But why did he do the right thing? The reason for doing the right thing was wrong. <coughs> he did the right thing only because it was in his own interest, okay? So you could say in a company, they might say, we better not damage the environment because if we damage the environment, nobody will buy our product, right? According to Kant, that's not doing the duty. That's just thinking in your own self-interest. It's not really uh, the correct. So he thinks we should use the, if we want to have moral worth, moral worth is uh, we are a moral person we should act according to duty. So, some example that, you know, something is not positive for us, we are damaged by that, but we still do it, is kind of duty. For example, if you have a sick relative who is in the nursing home, old person's home, you get no advantage by visiting them every week, right? You, you could be doing something else, but you decide to do that anyway. Then that's duty. You decide to do that because it's the right thing to do, then it's a duty, right? So Kant also has the definition of freedom. Uh, he says this is called, you don't have to remember this word, heteronomous determination. Doing something for the sake of something else, for the sake of something else. So we, we talked about humans are rational. So he has the same idea for freedom. So I go to college to get a higher paid job, to buy a house, to have a family, to do this, to do that. Okay, that's Kant's idea of freedom, that we're free to choose. We choose what we want to do at the end. Often in the interview you get asked, where do you see yourself in five years? 
where do you see yourself in 10 years, right? So people are free to make an objective, where I want to be in 5 years, where I want to be in 10 years, and then they're free to choose how to do that. So that is Kant's idea of freedom. <clears throat> so we asked a question in a previous class about the murder at the door, and we said Aristotle would say, if you were told him, my brother is upstairs, then you're being too honest. Okay, that would be an excess. But they asked Kant this question, because somebody asked this question to Aristotle. So somebody wanted to test Kant, so they said to Kant, what if a murderer comes to the door? It's the right thing, or is it your duty? <coughs> is it your duty to tell them the truth, even though it's a bad consequence for you? It's the right thing to do, so you should tell them the truth. Okay? So what did Kant say? He said, yes, you have to tell them, you, you don't have to, you can't lie to them. He said, lying to the murderer is wrong, not because it harms him, but because it violates the principle of right. So truthfulness in statements that cannot be avoid, avoided is the formal duty of man to everyone. So Kant thinks it's your duty to tell the truth, however great the disadvantage. So we can see different thinking from Aristotle that may arise therefore for him or any other. So do you agree with Kant in this case? If somebody came, comes to your door and wants to know where your brother is with a gun, They've just killed, you can see, six people dead on the street. What are you going to say? Are you going to tell them the truth because it's your duty? It's the right thing to do? Hmm? Or are you going to say, no, he, he, he's not here? Hmm? So what Kant said is that you can try to, you don't lie. Kant says you don't have to tell all the truth, but just don't lie. So he said you could tell them, for example, Oh, about an hour ago, I saw my brother at the shop. Okay, maybe it was true. Your brother was at the shop an hour ago, and now he's in the house. So Kant says you can do that kind of thing. But your duty is just not to lie, uh, because it violates this principle of right. So he had a real-life case. The emperor, Frederick of Germany, he asked Kant not to speak publicly about religion, because Kant was criticizing some religion. So the emperor asked him, don't speak publicly about religion. So he answered, as your majesty's faithful subject, I shall in future completely desist from all public lectures or papers concerning religion. So he made this statement because he knew that the emperor's health was very bad and he was going to die in a couple of years. So after a couple of years, the emperor died and Kant was able to talk publicly about religion again. Okay? So you can get this idea, like, he says, I sh as the majesty's subject, I shall in the future. So it's a little bit misleading. But his key point is he put it in here, as your majesty's subject. It means, while, while the, basically, while the king is alive, right? So it looks like in future he's not going to speak about religion. But he didn't say that clearly. So according to Kant, this is the way to avoid that problem. Okay, you don't have to lie to people directly. Okay, but just don't uh, tell them, I don't, uh, you don't have to tell them exactly the truth. Okay, so then let's have some discussion. Are there things that money shouldn't be able to buy? And what are they? So discuss with your partners. So we saw that Jack <coughs> Kant is talking about uh, respect and dignity of human beings, right? Is his main point. So what do you think? Is there any things that money shouldn't be able to buy? And what are they? For example, in some countries it's legal to sell your body part, like kidney. In the Philippines you can sell your kidneys, right? In the US you can't sell your kidneys, okay? Also, we have things like surrogate mother. Do you know surrogate mother? The woman can't have a child, so another woman agrees to have the fertilization treatment, right? So we can have those kind of things. So discuss with your partner. What do you think? You can think
think about some other things too. saw in the US some psychological problem and they shoot people? Yeah, it yeah. happened the same. Yes, it happened a couple of times, right? Anything else? Apart from guns? Things that people were able to do in the past, and perhaps in some countries they might be able to do, but generally not. Why, why not? Well, do you agree? With, are you going to use Kant's argument? It's against for this dignity. Point, I don't agree with him, like in all things, but with this one I agree. Mm -hmm. So it's against the respect and the dignity of the people to own them as a slave or a servant. And I think they should be able to buy landscape. I don't mean like. Uh, Square meter, but uh, mountain Everest and stuff like that. Uh, countries, national parks, yes. that kind of things. Okay, why not? It just owns to a certain country. Mm -hmm. Everybody should be able to enjoy that yes. that kind of thing, <coughs> right? We know we can even see these days the national sports event, but they won't let some private TV company buy the national sports event, right? has to be shown on the national broadcaster. So, uh, the next person we're going to talk about is uh, Rawls. So we're getting more modern. So, the point of Rawls is that we shouldn't, again, we're talking about uh, rights, 
Okay? Then he says we shouldn't sacrifice our fundamental rights and liberties for social and economic benefits. So we could see this clearly in the case of Ford Pinto. In Ford Pinto they wanted some economic benefit, but they sacrificed the fundamental rights. Okay, so Kant is saying everybody has dignity and so on. Right, the libertarians talked about the fundamental rights already, but uh, Kant was talking about uh, respect and duty, okay, dignity, and this guy is talking about, we have to look at fundamental rights against the social and economic benefits, and we should keep them. So he made this principle called difference principle. So only those social and economic inequalities are permitted that work to the benefit of the least advantaged members of societies. So we can understand this better if we look at an example. We pay doctors more than bus drivers. It's a social and economic inequality. Okay? The doctor is going to be richer, they're going to live in a better house, they're going to have bigger cars than the bus driver. Okay? So we, we have some social inequality which gives the social and economic benefit for the doctor. But why do we do this? Because we are improving the situation for everybody by increasing access to health care for the poor. So this is a widely used idea these days, right? Rawls' idea, I'm yes? I'm going to ask, but by paying to some people less, you actually make them poor. If you pay to the mm -hmm. bus driver less than the doctor, then you actually created a poor, poor person. Yes, so that's a social and economic inequality, right? Oh, okay. So he's saying that, he's admitting that that's an inequality. Oh, he's against so yeah, so he says, yes, that is an inequality, but he's justifying the inequality. He says, that's okay, because it's going to benefit the least advantaged members of society. Wait, so he says that it's good to pay doctors more, right? Yes, because if we don't pay doctors more, there's not going to be enough doctors, and then the poorer people won't be able to afford the medical care, right? It will be, the doctor's fee will be too expensive, there's not enough doctors, supply and demand, the doctor fee will go up very high, then the poor people won't be able to pay for the health care. Okay? So if we pay the doctors more, we'll have more doctors, and the health care will be cheaper for the poorer people. So that's his idea. That in that case it's okay. You don't have to agree with Rawls, right? Uh, this is philosopher's idea, but I'm just saying this is a widely accepted idea these days in most uh, countries, right? So, this is, as I say, it's called the difference principle. So, everybody has an unequal distrib distribution of talents and endowments. So, for example, I was born into a very wealthy family. Okay, my mother was an actress, my father was a politician, so I am very handsome, for example. Just an example. <laughs> and I also have very rich parents, okay, and they're very smart. So that's not the same as somebody who's born in, in a very poor family in the third world, okay? Their parents had no education and that person has, doesn't have much opportunities. So is it fair for the person, say me, to say, I, I'm richer than them because I deserve it, right? Is that okay or not okay? Do you think I deserve to be richer than that person in the third world? Do you understand the word deserve? Here we can, he used the word moral deserts. So actually we are quite lucky, right? Let's say that uh, a lot of the world's population is not born in the same conditions that if you're born in, in a de developed country, right? So, do people deserve something? Do you understand deserve? Right? So normally they say, do I deserve something because I'm more talented? So, if you look at Michael Jordan, do you know Michael Jordan? Yes. He gets paid, uh, he was getting paid hundreds of millions of dollars because he's a talented basketball player. Do you think he deserves that? Yes. Because he's talented at basketball? No. Hmm? No, why not? Because he just uh, doing sport. You think he was just born, like uh, Rose would say? 
you were just born lucky, born with that talent. Mm. Half. half born and half effort. Yes. Rawls also said effort is something that Maybe you get. More effort than, than yes. Rawls said effort is also something you get from your background. He says you're taught when you're young whether to make an effort or not to make an effort. So according to him, uh, they don't really deserve that, right? If you look in the US, the Supreme Court judge, the head of all the judges in the US, gets paid 160,000 US dollars a year. Do you know Judge Judy? She gets 25 million dollars a year. Just. Judge Judy is a TV judge in the US. She solves some pro problems between people for entertainment. So she gets paid 25 million, and the real judge of the Supreme Court gets 160,000. Do you think Judge Judy deserves 25 million? Hmm? So anyway, he says that we have to correct for the unequal distribution of talents and endowments without handicapping the talented. So he wants to correct for this. He thinks that people have unequal talent and unequal e effort, right? He wants to correct that. It's not fair. But he doesn't want to handicap the talented people. Do you understand handicap? Yes. Stop them. He doesn't want to stop the, the talented people. So he wants to encourage the gifted to develop and exercise their talents, but with the understanding that the rewards we get from these talents uh, get into the market, belong to the community as a whole. So he wants to find some way to encourage me to make the effort, develop my talents, do the best I can, but I should still understand that the reward I got is not mine, it belongs to the community. Okay. So this is his idea of, of uh, how to distribute justice, his difference principle. It's called an egalitarian, egalitarian principle. So if we had the utilitarian, the utilitarian might say just like free market system. They might say, uh, just let people, everybody just do what they want. And they might say that these people just deserve to have a higher, higher uh, income or so on. Then we have this mer meritocratic system, which is a free market with fair equality of opportunity. Do you understand equality of opportunity? So this is idea is that if we give everybody the same access to education, right? If we give everybody a similar kind of background, right? Just imagine everybody had the same income, everybody has the same access to education. Then, according to this system, that's, that's a good way to live, okay? But Rawls doesn't agree with this. The reason is, he says, even if you all have free education, Okay. Even if you all have the same income, I'm not picking on anybody, right? But you're still smarter than him, right? It's not just for an example. Okay. So you're still smarter than him. So you're still going to be earn a higher salary and be more successful, right? And he thinks that's not fair because he thinks the reason that you're smarter than him is because you were born smarter. Okay? Or your parents, when you were young, taught you how to make an effort. They instilled in you the right character to make an effort more than him. Okay? So he thinks that it's not your fault, right? It's, or it's not, you don't deserve to be rich. Do you understand that idea? Because you are just lucky to be born in that situation, rather than he, him to be born in that situation. You can't, can you choose your parents? You can't choose your parents says uh, Rawls. So Rawls has this difference principle. He wants to encourage you to do your best and be very successful, but you have to understand that you're going to have to pay some high tax, even though you're successful, okay? Um, but because you should understand that just you were lucky to be born in that situation. The other people weren't as lucky. So this is a commonly used principle today. So, <clears throat> Here he says, we do not deserve our place in the distribution of native talents, nor do we deserve the superior character. 
Some people say, well, Michael Jordan worked harder. He made a lot more effort than the other basketball players who had the same talent. So Michael Jordan deserves to get millions of dollars. But he says he doesn't deserve this superior character. Because when he was young, his family and social circumstances made him make an effort. Okay? For example, when I was young, I played sports. And my trainer always told us, winning is not important. Coach, just making an effort is the most important thing. Right? So he always tried to teach us, you have to make an effort. It doesn't matter if you're losing by 5 goals or 10 goals. You still have to make an effort, right? So some people have this kind of social circumstance where they get some coaches or family or something which teaches them you have to make an effort. So they were lucky to be in that situation. They were lucky to have this coach. Maybe Michael Jordan had that kind of coach when he was a kid, right? So he was lucky to have that kind of coach. So he thinks that, again, it's just kind of like luck. So he thinks the tax system requires the lucky to hand over some portion of their income to help the disadvantaged. It doesn't deprive them of something they morally deserve. So you can hear in the US many people will say, or utilitarians will say, why should I have to pay money to him? That's like stealing from me. Why should you take the tax from me and pay to him? Some people will say, that's like stealing. I deserve the money because I worked hard, okay? And I, I was talented. So I deserve the money. But Rawls doesn't agree with that. He says, no, you don't. You don't deserve the money. You're just lucky because of your situation. One, one proof of this is that uh, usually the older children make more effort than the younger children, even inside the family. Okay? How many of you are older, oldest child in the family? Oldest one. Do you understand the question? You're not the oldest child in the family? No? So, there's a theory, they've done some studies, and it's shown that the older children make more effort, usually, than the younger children in the family. Okay? They have to try, maybe because they're the first one, they have to try harder, and then uh, the parents aren't as strict on the younger children, maybe. Yeah, okay? it's true. You think it's true in your family? I have three younger siblings, yes. Okay. So your character can de also your character can depend on your family or social situation. Okay. So again, let's discuss this uh, relating to Ralph with our partner. It's not fair if the children of poor parents have much lower prospects in life than the children of rich parents, merely because of the family they were born into. Therefore, steep inheritance taxes are justified. Justified means fair. Or just? Do you agree? Do you understand inheritance? What does inheritance mean? Mother gave the house and money. Yes. So your father gives you money, your family gives you money or a house. Maybe before they die, maybe after they die. Okay, so in some countries they have inheritance taxes. If he gives you money, it means that you have to pay tax on that. Okay? money he gives you, or he gives you a house, he has to pay tax on the house, or your mother gives you a house, she has to, you have to pay tax, okay? So discuss with your group, do you agree with this or not? Do you agree with Roz? So if you get money from your father, say you get married and your father buys you a house, you should have to pay tax on the money your father gives you say 20%. He gives you $100,000, you have to pay $20,000 tax to the government. Because if, you, if your father gives you money, then you can afford a house, or the house price will go up. But he can't afford a house, his father doesn't have any money. Right? So it's not fair that you could get a house and he can't. Or you have a, a lot of money and he doesn't, just because of the way you were born. So steep here means high. So probably they're talking about 50% or more, 50% or more. So some people believe, like uh, Sting, do you know Sting? Sting is a very famous musician. He won't give any money to his kids. Even though he's a millionaire, he doesn't give any money to his kids. Just he paid for their university education. 
because he thinks like they should have to fight like the other people. It's not fair. So maybe he agrees with Rawls, right? In that case. So what do you think? So discuss with your group. Some other rich people don't give any <coughs> money to their kids, just they pay for their university and that's it, right? After that. children, but if the parents work very hard for the money, they earn it, and if they want to give them to charity, or if they want to give this money to their children, it's their own choice. So I don't agree. Alright, so this is, uh, again, this is the idea of Rawls, so you don't have to agree, or we can see in some countries they have a high inheritance tax, in other countries they don't have any inheritance tax, people have different ideas about that. Okay. So then let's uh, finish there for today. Thank you for the interesting discussion. We had some interesting opinions today.